should take this off and stand down there, but if you don't mind, I'll just stand here instead of here. Well, I'm always happy to be at this great university. My wife comes from Newton, Utah, just a little bit north of here, northwest of here. Uh, she was a farm girl, and dad was a great farmer, and, and I spent a lot of time up here in this area. So we love uh, Cache Valley, love this institution. I go all the way back, I was a basketball player, and uh, go all the way back to Wayne Estes' days when he was the great All-American here at, at Utah State University, and so many other things. Let me just say that uh, you have the best, one of the best basketball coaches in the world. He's a friend of mine, and I think the world of him. He just has a continual wonderful record. And I just, uh, I hope you always stay right here at Utah State University. And your team this year has done really, really well. I went to the game back in, uh, in Washington, and uh, at that time, I even, uh, as they were getting ready to start the second half, I went up and shook hands with Stu. And, and felt badly afterwards that I would bother him in the middle of concentrating on this game with Georgetown, uh, which they lost. I, uh, it, Georgetown's a great team, but uh, it, was a, it was a thrill for me to see our school back there in Washington, D.C., playing one of the you know, perennial powers uh, in, in Georgetown. So I'm happy to be here with you. I don't have any speeches that I want to make. Uh, I'd rather turn the time over to you and take your questions and uh, see if I can answer them. If I can't, I'll tell you. <laughs> if I can, I'll do the best I can to try and keep it down to two minutes. A lot of questions involve a lot of, a lot of things, so it's very difficult to answer when you've uh, had all the experience I've had in just a minute or two. But we'll see if we can get as many questions as we can, okay? All I ask of you is uh, uh, tell me your name, where you're from, what your majors and minors are, okay? Is that okay? You can remember to do that. That just helps me to become more acquainted and helps me to, to feel better. Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn time over to you. We'll just recognize who really wants to get up and ask any questions, okay? <coughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Um, just yell it out because it's a little hard to hear all the way down here. Okay. Now, if I understand your question, uh, as an author of a number of health care plans, how do I take care of these kids that uh, may not have health care? Well, I remember <coughs> back in the early 90s, uh, I had two, two couples from Provo, Utah, come and see me. Both husbands and both wives worked. Each family had six children. Neither family made more than combined income of $20,000. At that time, it was too much for their kids to qualify for Medicaid and too little for them to be able to purchase health care. And I started looking, at, looking into that, and I found that, that uh, the only kids in our country left out of the health care system were children of the working poor. In other words, people who worked, who tried, who were doing everything they could but couldn't afford to purchase health insurance, and their kids were, uh, could not get Medicaid. So I came up with the Child Health Insurance Program. But you'll notice there was one letter that was very important. It was the S CHIP program. Why was the S important? Well, I went to Ted Kennedy, who was my partner on the, uh, on the committee, and perennial powerhouse for the Democrats. And I said, no, I want to help these kids, these children are working for They're the only ones left out of the system. Okay, okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted it to be a little more liberal bill so he could get all the liberal groups on. Well, naturally, I told him, I said, it's not going to be that in the end. It's going to be a, a block grant to the states, but the states have a control over the program. Oh, sure, sure. You know. <laughs> well, well, we granted the bill, and we both went after it. We went up and down the land. It took two years. And finally, uh, I was on the Finance Committee, the most powerful committee in the, in the United States Senate. And we were marking up the balanced budget bill. First balanced budget in over 40 years. And 
there was just the right opportunity for me to just raise it right there. So I stood up, and, and we were in the, in, in the back room. This is going to take a little more than two minutes. We were in the back room. We were in the back room. Very little staff there. And uh, I called up the amendment, which was the chip to, to add to the balanced budget act. Well, a furor started. I mean, after I got through making the pitch, Alphonse Stamata, who was then the senator from New York, shot out of his chair talking 4,000 words and they saying, That's a right, that's a right, that's a right, that's a right, that's a right. <laughs> he was going on and on like that. And uh, then, oddly enough, a very mild-mannered person, Frank Murkowski from Alaska, stood up. From Alaska. And he stood up and said, Orrin is right, this is something that has to be done. And so, Pat Moynihan from New York is the leader of the Democrats, and I said, well, Patrick, I said, uh, where do the Democrats stand on this? And he said, you know how, what he was, he was the typical professor, he said, uh, well, uh, how do the Democrats, how are you going to vote on this? Those who are in favor of Senator Hatch's bill, please raise your right hand, and all the Democrat hands went up. And at that point, uh, at that point, uh, it went into the balanced budget act. Now, it was the glue that held the first balanced budget in over 40 years together. Because the Democrats couldn't vote against CHIP, and the Republicans couldn't vote against the balanced budget. And so it did pass. Well, immediately after it passed, well, and before we went out of the, out of the uh, committee room where we were marking up, where we were talking about the bill before we went out to the big caucus room to debate what couldn't be agreed to, as I walked back into, into the uh, into the any room, the secretary said, Senator Kennedy's on the line. Now, this was late at night. I, somebody had tipped him off. And so I took the call, and it went like this. <clears throat> he got a rough voice, and I said, I thought he'd be overjoyed. I said, yeah. He said, I have never been so betrayed in my whole time in the United States. Well, that made me mad. And I said, oh, I said, why is that? He said, because of what you just did. I said, well, Teddy, it's very strange to me. I said, it seems to me that uh, only two people seem to be against it, you and Phil Graham. I said, I must have done something right. Wham! And I said, the, I said well, I knew it was going to happen. The next day, Ted Kennedy was the first one into my office. And, he, and he, as he walked in, he said, Warren, he said, that was really amazing what you did last night. I couldn't believe it. He said, that's what you're going to be on the history of one of the most important bills. And, and I started to laugh because he couldn't say, I apologize. <laughs> that was the way he was. And I started to laugh, and he started to laugh. And, uh, but the S of that's very important because it was a truly Republican, conservative bill in the end. That's why it wasn't, that's why it's mad. He wanted to be that liberal bill, but, but I was straight with, forward with him. I told him it was going to be this type of a bill. He just never thought we'd get it passed. But he could use me out front to say, here's this one Republican who's standing up, and all these other rotten Republicans won't do it. See? Well, uh, he was really shaken when we finally passed that bill, but he was also very pleased, and he considers that one of the most important bills that he ever worked on. And it was one, because it took care of six million American children. One of the first things that Obama did when he took over was make it a better welfare bill. It wasn't that. The states ran it better, they do a better job. I believe in 50 state laboratories, where you can look and pick and choose and see what works and what doesn't work among the various states. And it works a lot better if we use the principles of, of uh, federalism, which is what our Constitution is all about. Well, it's a little longer, I should tell you. Next. We, we have a few questions. That sure. They wrote. Oh, you've got, there, oh, you've got them. And they're coming in. Do you so, want to read them off to me? Yeah. We'll, we'll have them ask the question. Uh, the first question is from Ian Binks, if you just want to stand and ask your question. We just okay. want to make sure we had a good variety of questions. So, just talk a lot. And this has, to do with the dream, this has to do with the DREAM Act. Okay. Ian, yeah. just talk as well. Okay. okay. So, uh, my question was, originally it seemed like you were in favor of the DREAM Act, uh, which would allow illegal, or children of illegal immigrants given a path to citizenship if they went to college or served to you in the military. Um, and well, originally yeah. it seemed like you were in favor of the act, but then when it actually came up for the vote, it, you voted against it. And so my question is, what changed okay. in that process? I was the author of the Dream Act. I was the author who wrote the original Dream Act. That, that Dream Act was recognition that children of, of, of undocumented people we should not hold it against them that they were brought into this country as young people. And the purpose of it was to allow them, if they met the requirements of basically graduating, living a clean life, and doing these type of things, to be able to get in state tuition. That's what the original Dream Act did. They made it much broader than that and made it into an amnesty bill. And I couldn't support that. I can't support amnesty. 
And I don't think we're ever going to get this problem solved until we secure our borders. So I filed a very comprehensive bill just last year right at the end and this year right at the beginning. It basically will give law enforcement the, the, the teeth to be able to secure our borders. If we get the borders secured, then I think we have a real basis upon which to try and resolve these very important immigration issues. But that's, that's what happened. I frankly couldn't support a bill that just ran an amnesty. And, and basically expanded the coverage uh, way beyond where it should have been expanded. It was another Democrat overreach is what it was. And I hated to vote against it because I really believe that we should never hold it against the children of people who are undocumented, who, who are not at fault because they were brought into this country. Uh, and uh, <coughs> really, and uh, so that, that was the reason. Yeah. Our next question, we have Ben Wilson. He had a yeah. question about TARP for you. Okay, Ben. Yes, I was just wondering if you could take us through your thought process from voting for TARP to I understand that you're now opposed to it. To be, to be getting killed, you mean, by the Tea <laughs> Party? <laughs> Why did I vote for TARP? Well, you know, in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have voted for it because I should have been more skeptical of what they would do with it. But it was in, uh, if I recall it correctly, it was in October of the at the end of the year, the country was heading into a, a deep recession, and something had to be done. The Secretary of Treasurer, the Treasury was, was a, a very good friend, and he felt the only thing we could get done in the end of that session was to, to do the, the Travel Asset Relief Program. And that program was to raise enough money so that, that, so that uh, we could stimulate the economy and hopefully keep it from going into a depression. Well, my reasoning was this. Uh, if we didn't support TARP, and it had overwhelming support, bipartisan support, if we didn't support TARP, we would have had October, November, December, January, February, and probably March before anything would substantively would have been done. And if that's the case, we'd be in a depression. And that's what m most of the top economists were saying. And I believe that. And so I did vote for it. I feel badly that I did vote for it because they then changed it dramatically and I think misused the tariff funds. And uh, part of that was in the Obama administration. And uh, uh, they had enough votes without me. But I have to say this, if my vote had made the 51st vote, I would have voted for it. For one reason, and that is we could not go six months without dramatically trying to do something about the really serious recession that was developing. It actually was an asset at that time. So that was the reason. And uh, I think most people are <coughs> off of the, the criticism of TARP, except, and I have to say, our Tea Party people are very incensed about that. And frankly, I agree with the Tea Party people. I think that uh, it's about time we reared up in this country and said, enough. We're spending way too much. We're going into debt too far. We're, uh, we're, we're mortgaging the future of you young people. And we're not willing to do anything about bringing entitlements under control. Entitlements are Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, just to mention a few. CHIP now is made into an entitlement program. It was never meant to do that. That's why I voted against CHIP when the president came when they came up with their, making it just another welfare bill. So I, I really have all the fiscal conservative credentials, but I thought at the time that's what I should do, and uh, I'm not ashamed that I did, but uh, the way they used it, I wish I had voted for it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sure. okay. I got another question from Sage Bowman. If you understand, uh, this has to do with the Defense of the Marriage Act. That's me. Doma. Okay. That's me. Yeah, this is something that I guess it's hit the news this week. It's been something that's kind of been in the works for a while. And I'll apparently, because I don't think you can hear them in the back, so I'll just, just so people understand, there's, a, there's a, a law that's been on the books for 15 years. Even President Clinton signed it. They said marriage should be between a man and a woman. And recently this week, the report is that the Obama administration isn't going to honor that as a law. There's a lot of talk in the Deseret News article about he basically over overrode um, the judicial